Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just going to wait about 30 more seconds for everyone to be able to join the main room. Make sure that your volume is on and that everyone can hear us um, and we will launch into it. So just going to give us a few seconds. Okay, so welcome everybody. Not going to wait any longer. We're at two o'clock Eastern on the nose. Welcome to all of you from C to C to C. This webinar is intended to provide you with more information about the Foundation's Community Needs Grants uh, and help you prepare to write your proposal. My name is Jacqueline Hall. I am the program manager at the Foundation responsible for supporting these grants as well as our Rebuilding Lives grants, which are multi-year uh, gender-based violence focused funding stream. Some housekeeping items. I will try not to talk too quickly, but if I do, uh, you can raise your hand or type it in the question box, chat box, or whatever other box allows you to type into there. So uh, if things are moving too quickly, please just flag it. Uh, to note, I will keep all questions for the end of the presentation, but you can type these into the question box or the Q&A box at any time. Um, so please type your questions at will. Uh, know that I will not answer them though till I run through all of my speaking notes. Uh, and last but not least, note that this webinar is being recorded. The contents of the presentation will be made available on our YouTube channel and our website. That does not include your names or uh, any questions. Um, I see that live transcript is available. If you need that, that also, uh, you can turn that on for yourselves. So jumping right into it. The annual, uh, the annual grants, I apologize. Formerly called the annual grants, the community needs grants are single year funding aimed at providing short-term flexible support to organizations that offer programs and services aligned with one of the foundation's three funding pillars. We'll go over what those three pillars are in a moment. Um, but to give you a sense of what we mean by short-term and flexible, some examples of the types of activities that we will fund um, to supplement a funding gap for existing operational, administrative, or program costs, to pilot projects or support program development, uh, to adapt existing service offerings using new technology or approaches and support the staff accordingly, or to reinforce the work of coalitions and service coordination or advocacy work. Again, just examples, but again, to re the point is to reiterate that you can apply for uh, anything from operational uh, or operationally focused costs to programs to um, development of networks in your locale or your region with other partners uh, doing work in one of the three pillar areas. Um, some criteria. So we'll talk a bit just about some of the high level criteria um, that your organization needs to meet if you want to qualify for one of these grants. Um, they are uh, for $20,000. We have a budget to support 25 of those. Um, to be deemed eligible for a community needs grant, you must demonstrate that your proposal meets the following criteria. Uh, that your organization holds charitable or qualified donee status um, so that you have the appropriate status registration with the Canadian Revenue Agency. If your organization does not have charitable status or is not a qualified donee, we can consider an application uh, from your organization, but it must be submitted in partnership with another organization that is a registered charity or holds qualified donee status, um, and that this organization have a mandate relevant to your proposal. Uh, the other organization's board of directors will have the fiscal responsibility for the grant and will be legally responsible for ensuring that the funds are spent for the charitable purposes intended. What that means is if this is how you apply, we would be signing the funding agreement with the partner holding charitable status, and suggest an arrangement or uh, agreement in between the two organizations for how work will be done. 
Uh, your organ other criteria, your organizational mandate is a big one on uh, this grant stream. Um, so looking to support aligned organizations. So gender-based programming, services, and or advocacy are core or central to your organization's mission. And you have significant experience working with and or for girls, two-spirit, women, girls, two-spirit, trans, and non-binary people who face multiple barriers and are underserved. And as well, your organization is defined as a smaller grassroots organization with a budget inferior to $1 million per year, or you are a shelter, transitional, or other housing provider with an operational budget inferior to $2 million per year. Uh, you'll see in the guidelines that we will accept applications from larger organizations, and we've provided a couple of, of examples, uh, band councils, shared platforms, hamlets, that can provide an application on behalf of a local nonprofit that does not have the qualifying charitable or qualified donee status. Um, other considerations, you are the only show in town. We had a question actually this morning at the in our French session around uh, if your organization is larger, but there is literally no one else doing gender-based work in your community. Um, this might particularly be the case in a rural, remote, or more northern community. Uh, we can accept an application uh, from organizations larger, again, where you're the only show in town. If you are unclear or have questions about this, I will be providing my contact information at the end. We can talk about the specifics of your application. And last but not least, it's time to talk about the alignment with the foundation's funding pillars. So the reason we talk about your organization needing to, uh, the, the your work needing to align with the, pro, uh, the foundation's pillars as opposed to the proposal is in some cases you'll be applying for operational funding, um, in which case you're not telling us about a project, you're telling us about your organization. Um, and so uh, what we're talking about is alignment of your organization um, with one of the following pillars. So gender-based violence, economic security, or girls' empowerment. You can read more about those again in the guidelines linked on our site. Um, but your work should be aligned with one of those three pillars in order to qualify for community needs grants funding. Additional considerations. So these are not... Um, criteria. There's not, uh, there are a few questions that help us to assess this, um, but we are not uh, exclusively looking at these pieces. Of course, organizations that can demonstrate any and all of these considerations will be prioritized by the committee. Um, and that's because the community's grants are highly competitive. We receive a large number of applications for only 25 eligible grants. Priority will be given to those that can demonstrate that their organizations are led by and for um, the populations being served, um, that you communicate um, clearly how the funding will be spent, that you clearly uh, identify how your organization can apply a feminist, intersectional, trans inclusive, and sex work po positive analysis to your organizational structure and activities, that you demonstrate under, uh, an understanding of the intersections of inequity and barriers to participation, such as race, class, gender, sexual identity, or orientation, disability, immigration, or indigenous status, language, occupation, and or geography, um, and so on. So again, where you can in the questions demonstrate an understanding of these things or how they will be impl included in your approach um, will go a long way to uh, strengthening the application. Some general notes. Uh, we will only accept one application per organization across all streams. So your organization might do GBV work as well as girls empowerment programs. You can only apply for one, unfortunately. Uh, the foundation does not fund the same initiative more than three times under any of our annual grant streams. And so what that means is if you have been funded three times for a piece of work, 
you can again still apply, but you'll have to apply for a different project initiative or piece of work. Uh, similarly, if you um, are currently being funded by another one of the grant streams, same thing, you'd have to submit a proposal for a different piece of work. We cannot fund the same uh, work under two different grants. Things we don't fund. Um, I will let you glance at them. The one I always like to highlight a bit, conferences, festivals, seminars, and symposiums. They can be part of a wider application. They cannot be the sole focus of your application. We do not fund events, regardless of what they're called. Um, so we do not fund one-off events. You will, if they're part of, for example, you want to run a girls empowerment program and are talking about some sort of get together year end activity um, that has a more significant cost absolutely can be included as long as it's tied to a larger program or initiative. Um, similarly, academic or university research, the main point here is we will not fund research for the sake of research's sake. It should be attached to some sort of initiative either to uh, focus or shift the way your organization is working, for example, uh, to contribute to some of your advocacy efforts, but should be attached to something practical um, and not exclusively research focused. Process and timeline, this is the big one everyone wants to know. Applications are due Thursday, January 26th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Adjust accordingly. If you're in Newfoundland, that's 3.30, uh, sorry, 6.30 p.m. for you. Uh, if you're in British Columbia, it's 2 p.m. for you. Um, the, the online application portal will close automatically at 5, possibly 5.01. Uh, on that date. If you require more time, you must reach out to me ahead of that timeline to figure out how you might submit something past that date, if possible. Uh, review some other key dates that you see on here. Uh, the committee takes about two months uh, or yeah, somewhere within that two months to read all of the applications. For Backgrounder, we usually receive about 200 plus applications uh, and our committee is about a dozen and a half uh, people. So it takes them a little bit to read through all of those applications and then they get together to render their final decisions in April um, where they will make selections for 25 grants approximately. Um, that list goes to the board for approval by May and our intent, it says here June that applicants are notified. We are really hoping to be able to actually let people know more like the in the late May range, but we're committing to June. Um, but hopefully by late May, letting everyone know whether your application was successful or not. Uh, and the reason being we're hoping to do it a little earlier, the funding kicks in for June 15th. Um, so hoping to get funding agreements to successful applicants sooner rather than later so that we can make sure those are signed and paid by June 15th. Okay, we're gonna go through a couple slides that help to explain how to navigate the online portal. I know that tech is not everyone's friend, um, but a few things to consider before delving into the online application itself. So before you start, there are a few documents available on our website um, at the links provided on this slide. Uh, so you'll see in the sidebar of those pages, there are, is a document called the grant guidelines. Uh, this outlines all of the criteria and considerations for how the committee will weigh its decisions. There is an instructions document which provides Insights and guidance on how to answer some of the questions. So where a question might feel a bit loose, it provides you with a greater sense of the information that is being sought, word limits, other things uh, that will help you in preparing your application. Um, and a frequently asked questions document. Uh, so every time we see some new questions and see some patterns, I make sure to throw it in there. Um, so good to review. Uh, taken, you know, each year take uh, quite a bit of time rebuilding or uh, modifying these documents to keep them relevant. So uh, it is the best place to find the information you require. 
to get started on that same web page linked previously, um, you will need to apply online. Uh, for many of you who have submitted some sort of application before, you will already have a username and password, um, but you will still need to click on the link to activate a new application. If you've never applied to the foundation before, you'll have to go through the steps of setting up a new user. Um, so from the website, you click on the link and then and click the registration button on the main community needs grants page of our website. Once you've signed in, it will you will receive an automatic email that confirms um, your registration and you'll be able to sign in with that email and password to continue at any point. You can return to my account at a later date using the same login credentials to start or continue working on your application, which we'll look at in a moment. But it ultimately, the my account page is the second link on our website. So when you look, you'll see two links. One, the first one is to get you set up and started. And the second one is just to go back in every time you want to continue working on your application. Once you sign in, this is where you will land. It is an eligibility form. You'll be prompted to answer four questions. The first three of these are simple yes, no questions. You must answer yes to all of them. If you do not, you will receive an email saying you are not eligible um, for this funding. Uh, and it's ultimately because this outlines three main criteria that you must meet in order to be eligible. And the last question is, to ultimately select the correct form, um, which is uh, either you have a charitable number or you are you have qualified donor status, or you do not and you need to work with an organization that does, in which case you're selecting the second form. If you've made a mistake or need to know which situation applies to you, any of that, of course, once I provide the contact information at the end of this, uh, presentation, you can reach out to me at any time. Once you've signed in, you'll, um, once you've, excuse me, completed the eligibility form, it brings you to this page, which will show you any and all applications in progress. Um, ignore mine, they say 2021, I don't bother updating the screenshot, the page looks the same. Um, when you are in here, you can, uh, this is the page where you will go to just con continuously select and go back in and update and keep working on your application. There's a few buttons on the side I want to explain uh, that may be useful to you. Um, so the first is uh, transfer, when you hover your cursor over it, you'll see it says transfer to new owner. For example, if you are the person drafting the application, but you need to send it along to your executive director for approval and submission, you can transfer it to them. Similarly, if you want to transfer it to a partner for them to be continuing to work on and submit, uh, you can do that. The second icon is to manage viewers. So this is to allow others in your organization or partners to view what you're working on without necessarily being able to make changes. So for folks to view drafts, but not to uh, without your knowledge, make changes to the application, uh, possibly submit without you knowing. Uh, there is a delete button. So if, for example, by accident, you've started two or three applications, you can delete the ones that are not uh, relevant or current. Last but not least, email a copy. Uh, particularly helpful right before you hit submit, you might want to send yourself a copy so that you have it in the case anything goes wrong. Uh, this is a particularly useful button for us Gen Xers who are less trusting of technology. When you uh, log into the main page of the application form, you will see these things at the top and I'll explain uh, what all of the tabs and the circled items are. Uh, so in the circle, you will see uh, guidelines, instructions, FAQ. These are simply quick hyperlinks to the same documents you will find on our website. Perhaps as you're working through, you really want to, something triggers a question and you want to be able to view, you can click here easily and quickly back to those documents um, without logging out. Um, you'll also see four tabs and going to just explain what is found under each of those. Oh, excuse me, I've skipped too quickly. Uh, so the first tab includes questions that are primarily related to you and or your partner organization where applicable. 
Um, so if you are a non-charitable org and you're working with a partner, this is also where you're entering that partner's information. The second tab includes questions related to the proposed activities. Um, so, uh, and when I say activities, I also sometimes use the word project in the, this uh, presentation, noting, we're really saying you can, as noted earlier, this uh, grant stream will fund administrative and operational dollars exclusively, if that's what you require. When I say the word project and activities, please understand that you can also still be putting in um, uh, an application for your operations and answering the qu questions accordingly. The third tab that reads supporting documents is, as the name implies, it's where you upload all of your attachments. It's where you will find the, a link to download the budget template you, that you need to complete um, and where you can uh, submit all of the needed support letters. Uh, if you, for example, want to include a work plan where you can include that, uh, policies, other things. Um, most going to flag, you'll see on the top, there's a little asterisk, red asterisk symbol. That is just, you'll see it throughout the application. It denotes mandatory fields. Most fields are mandatory. Um, and so there is uh, very limited information that we do not require. Uh, but if you're unsure, whenever you see that asterisk, it means you need to enter something. Um, in some questions, we've denoted where it does not apply to you to please indicate not applicable or NA, um, but you will need to enter something into those fields in order to be able to submit. Um, note also on the top right, you can print uh, or email yourself a draft copy at any point, um, as well as save and finish at the bottom of every page so that you again can you know, stop working on it one day and come back another uh, to uh, finish off. The supporting documents tab, I'm gonna go through it in a little more detail so that you know A, how it works and what's in here. Uh, so some things to remember, all documents should be in a PDF format. This includes the budget form and we ask you to upload the budget form in a single page view PDF. So you will download it. It will be downloaded as an Excel document so that uh, you can insert lines uh, in some cases, enter your amounts and descriptions, but you should uh, convert it to a PDF before attaching it. Similarly, um, there are sections for audited financial statements and so on. We ask again that it be in a PDF format. Um, it's easier to, for viewing for our committee members. Uh, each field will only allow for one document to be uploaded. So if you are looking to upload more than one document uh, in a field, for example, the obvious one, letters of support or partner letters, you will need to merge them into a single PDF. We have one dedicated additional documents field for any additional materials, again, work plan, timelines, other things that you think are helpful to telling a story about your proposed work. If you're working with an organizational partner, as you can see on the screen here, uh, under uploaded financial statements, you see that there are two fields and that's because when, if you are working with an organizational partner, I, again, to reiterate, this is where your organization does not hold charitable status, so you are applying jointly with one that does. We will require the audited financial statements or the financial statements from both organizations. Um, if your organization is smaller, it might not be audited. Um, to upload the documents, you will need to click on the choose file button in order to select from your computer or uh, cloud-based uh, drive to upload. And once you've selected it, you will then need to click the upload button. It's a bit of a two-stepper here to make sure that it uploads correctly. As you see here, I've made a lot of mistakes in mine. So on the review my application tab, so the fourth and final tab, this is where it will the system will flag to you any places where you have not 
completed or incorrectly completed a field. So the numerical fields won't let you put in text, for example, um, or you've missed a required field. Um, it, so if you get this error, it means you need to go back and fix the questions that it flags for you. If you do not get it, you're ready to hit the submit button. Some tips and tricks for sticking out uh, in our committee's eyes in a good way. Um, so staff and committee have spent a lot of time drafting guidelines, instructions, documents, as well as continuing to populate that frequently asked questions section. Highly recommend reviewing them. A lot of the answers that you uh, to questions you might have are in there. You will note the assigned word limits for each question. They're, they're in the application. They're also listed in the instructions. Um, the, while these are intentionally limited, we do recommend using them to your advantage as much as possible. Simply put, a single sentence answer will not provide sufficient detail for the committee's consideration. Um, it doesn't tell us enough, usually. The main reason here is that the um, foundation works with a committee of volunteers in its decision making. These volunteers live at, in, across various regions of Canada, uh, they may not be as familiar with your work. So if you are based in one region, regardless of how well known your organization might be in feminist circles, uh, it's possible that committee members from other parts of the country are less familiar with your work. So be explicit in stating your organization's approach and previous experience with the proposed community and with delivering gender-based program services or advocacy work. Uh, you'll want to highlight the need for funding. There's a question that asks you about the need. Note why this work is important to your organization or to your community now. Why this specific intervention or action is needed in this place at this time. Please refrain from using this section to outline research or statistics from external sources that speak to an issue more broadly. And I say this because again, the committee is largely comprised of folks working in um, the community-based or gender-based uh, program delivery space. Um, so why, what they want to know is why you are the right organization to do this kind of work at this time. Uh, they're less, uh, they don't need a lesson on why GBV services are needed more generally. Um, they'll probably be well versed in gender based violence as an issue uh, more broadly. Um, and also be sure in the question to, in the re relevant question, to highlight how the funds will be used to advance your work in meeting the needs that you have noted. Um, so how, if, uh, if you've noted, a need for a direct service, how does the funding help you do that? If you've noted a need for operational dollars, uh, tell us how those dollars support your operations. Some quick things not to do. Um, proposals that do not fit the mandate of the foundation or the calls for proposals and subsequently recycled uh, proposals. And I'll put those two together please recycle a proposal where you can. We recognize your time is tight um, and you can only apply to so many foundations, government or other funders in a day uh, or at a time. So where you can recycling makes sense, but just make sure that you're recycling one that fits with the call for this, uh, this proposal. Um, so, you know, something that speaks to your experience and need for gender-based program services advocacy work. Um, you won't be penalized if you neglect to erase the name of the other funder, um, but definitely that it should, the proposal that you're recycling should uh, align with the ask of this call for proposals. Incomplete applications are, are tricky. Uh, the system doesn't let you complete, submit an application if you haven't uh, answered a question, but some people go and put X's throughout the application in order to uh, skip pages or put placeholder notes. Just make sure to go review and complete those, um, those, uh, those questions before hitting the submit button. And again, the system will close on January 26th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, if 
you needed more time, you will have had to made, have, have made the request prior to that timeline. So if you reach out after, it will not be accepted. Again, these are highly competitive um, uh, granting proposals or processes. And so we try to gift ourselves the ability to limit it where possible and late applications are just an easy way to, to do that. Um, of course, need to thank generous donors. For those unaware, the foundation, uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation is a public foundation, and that means we have to fundraise every dollar that we grant out. Um, and so without these donors, the community needs grants would not be possible. And we've come to the end of the presentation portion. I'm going to invite you to insert, uh, type in the Q&A uh, box or the chat box, any and all questions that you have um, to date. You will see on the screen my contact information uh, that you can reach out to for comments, questions, or to schedule a time. So I'm going to say I am happy to connect with any and all applicants to talk about your proposed idea, to talk through any challenges you're having in completing the application, and will work to review drafts if that is something that's helpful to you. Um, so encourage folks to reach out sooner rather than later. I will disclose that I will be away from December 23rd to January 3rd, but otherwise in the office five days a week and happy to schedule times. Uh, I have a public calendar that if you email me, I will reply with the link so that you can uh, book a time directly in my calendar. So I'm gonna open the Q&A box. This means you still have a, queue, a few minutes to um, be able to um, type yours in, I will uh, answer these in, I will read them aloud and answer them in turn without identifying the name. So first question, can a charity apply more than once in partnership with different organizations? For example, two to three different nonprofits with different projects for the nonprofits, but the same charity is the primary partner for each. And I will answer the question in a way that feels a bit contradictory. A single charity can, for the purposes of the application, support more than one nonprofit. However, if more than one of those nonprofits are successful, we will only be able to sign an agreement with one of them. Um, we can only have agreements with one charitable partner per grant stream at a time. And so um, the caveat to that, of course, is it also depends what region you are in. The decision making around our grants takes into, effect, in, into account uh, geography. There are a certain number of grants allocated per region. And so if you are particularly, if you are in a smaller region, the likelihood of funding two grants in the same place is highly unlikely. Um, so it's a consideration to think about how many times you wanna lend out your charitable number to applicants, especially if you want to apply yourself, because through the decision making process, it may happen naturally that only one of them is funded or successfully funded. But if more than one is, uh, then somebody's going to have to find a new charitable partner. Second question If gender based programming is one of our core mandates, but we are not a gender exclusive org i.e. we offer inclusive counseling and support services to all marginalized folks in the area with an intersectional lens, are we still eligible to apply for a program that primarily serves women and gender diverse folks? In this case, it would be to, uh, a program to support undocumented and migrant women and gender diverse community members. So the answer is yes. Gen we will fund organizations that do not do gender-based programming exclusively but it must be core to your work. Really what we're trying to say is, if this is your first time trying to delve into gender-based programming, please do not apply. If you've never run a gender-based violence program, if you've never run a girls' empowerment program, if you've never delivered economic empowerment programs 
for women, non-binary, trans folks, please do not apply. If, however, you have all had this at the as you know core activities for a number of years, absolutely, this grant cycle is for you. Next question. The project must be from an, an established organization rather than an initial project. I, I'm going to read this, but I will let you um, correct me if I'm reading this incorrectly. The project must be from an organization that hold, that is a registered nonprofit organization with either charitable status or working with a charitable partner. If what you mean by an initial project is it's a, a, a collective of individuals that have no organization, you're looking to get something started off the ground, then yes, this you will not be eligible to apply. It is for or nonprofit organizations, either with their own charitable status or applying in partnership with an organization that holds charitable status. That said, if you are looking to start an initial project, you can always find a local organization. Perhaps you've been, you already have a partnership with a local charitable organization that's been helping you get this thing off the ground. They can apply on your behalf and subcontract some of the work out. So happy to talk more about the specifics of your situation um, in a separate call. Could I provide examples of successful grants? Um, yes, and if you can hold on one second, I will pull things out. So uh, for anyone and everyone on this call, the foundation lists all of our successful grants on our webpage. You go to the tab that says our work, uh, and then from there it is areas of impact. It's not I understand not as intuitive as people would like to uh, like it to be. Um, in there, it lists all of our grants across grant streams. Uh, you can filter them by location. You can filter them by grant stream and so on. So I'm literally going to put things in the chat to everyone here for the link. Voila. Sorry for that awkward pause while I got that out. Um, but there are a number of, so last year, I think we funded 27 grants, um, the year before, probably about the same 28. Um, and the reason being, we have budget to fund 25 fully funded projects. There's always a few that come in asking for less than the maximum $20,000, in which case we allocate the additional funds to another. Um, so there are examples of successful grants uh, in uh, that online, in uh, in the website, excuse me. When does the online application, uh, the online portal application open? It opened the day we launched these grants on December 1st. So it has been open for just under two weeks now. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, you can reach out by email and we can help you navigate those, but it is and should be working. Next question. We are a nonprofit and will partner with a registered charity, in this case, who open, register for the account, and make the application my organization or that charity. Hmm. Uh, the answer to that question is so you are part, part, um, applying jointly in the eligibility quiz. So you click on the link from our website to start your application. That first tab that said that says eligibility quiz will have four questions. The first three are yes, no's. You will, in the last question, select the second option. And I apologize, I'm just going to go back to that slide so that I can remember what it says. Here we go. So select one, we are a registered charity or we are working with an organizational partner. You're selecting the second one. We are working with an organizational partner that is a re registered charity or qualified donee. Everywhere where it says operational, par uh, operational partner, you're inserting the charitable organization's information um, because they are your operational partner is the language we use. For many others, you're talking about a trustee. So think about operational partners, the trustee, wherever we're asking for that information, we're asking for your partner's information. Again, uh, if you have questions about that, you can always reach out to me 
via email or call, putting that back up on the screen for everybody. Next question, is it beneficial when applying for admin support funds to have multiple budget lines, i.e. office space, staff, and accounting fees, or is it okay to ask for the full 20 uh, for one item such as executive director? Also, does the partner charity have to retain part of the grant or could they disperse the entire amount to the non-charity? Uh, double a question here. So uh, in the first question, you will see, and we explain it in the instructions document, we do not have an admin line. The foundation never has an admin line like other funders. The reason being, especially in this case, you could apply for 100% of this budget to go to operational or admin dollars, but we do ask you to explain where. Um, and so there's no preference, if you will, on the part of the committee of whether or not you allocate $20,000 to a single operational or administrative staff person, or if you break it out among a couple of lines, but it should align with the need you're talking about. So if you are applying for a full operational budget, you can tell us what's happened. You've had a shortfall or a pitfall in your fundraising this year. Costs are up. Perhaps you're trying to adapt to new ways of working because of the post-pandemic era. Um, so just making sure your budget items that you ask for align with that need question. Um, if in the case you are applying for a program and you're only asking for a small portion of administrative dollars, same thing, please tell us where. Um, you don't need to say admin. We are okay with you charging for program or office space at an amount that you need. We're really just wanting to know what money you need for what. Um, no limit, again, uh, in terms of an admin line. The second part of that question was, does the partner charity have to retain part of the grant? For us, no. Uh, the budget does not, we do not uh, mandate that you offer a certain amount of your budget to the charitable partner. However, that's for you to negotiate with them. Uh, if your charitable partner insists on keeping $1,000 in administrative fees, include that in the budget. Um, it is not uncommon. We see it often. Of course, if they're asking for too much, it will, the committee will notice. Um, and so when I say too much, um, this is a small $20,000 grant. Um, so, you know, anything in excess of $2,000, it start, we start asking why the charitable partner is asking for such a significant portion of such a small budget that will not have a lot of administration work. So, Happy to discuss more if you have questions about that. What if the project is outside of Canada? Does it still count or it has to be only in Canada? We do not fund any zero period activities outside of Canada. It is uh, one of the things we do not fund. It is listed in every one of our documents. The Canadian Women's Foundation, our own charitable mandate is to fund gender-based work in Canada. Uh, so you cannot use any of the dollars to support work outside of Canada. No conferences, no travel, zero dollars. Uh, so the man, you, your application will need to be for work in Canada and you would need to demonstrate, if you have a double mandate, there are some organizations that work in Canada and externally you will in the application need to make clear that the funds are going to be used exclusively for your operations in Canada. Next question. And again, this is, and I'm just going to say, this is my last one. So if you have any other questions, please insert them into the chat now um, or the Q&A now. So last question, would it be beneficial and allowed to include graphic images with stats in the application? You cannot include them in the online portion of the portal. It only accepts text in the supporting documents tab. There is an additional documents um, uh, space where you can upload. So you will need to merge all of those things into a single um, document or a single PDF and upload them there. Um, and again, this is it, beneficial. It largely depends on how relevant it is to the direct work that you are proposing to do. As noted, 
previously, the committee will have general knowledge um, related to issues of gender-based violence, feminist economic security, and girls empowerment issues. But if you have images or stats that pertain to your community that stem perhaps from an evaluation you've done that talk about the importance of your work or the impact of your work, uh, those sorts of things, you can attach them in the additional documents um, section of the, of the supporting documents tab. So seeing no additional, oh no, sorry, more questions have come in. Thank you all. Uh, an additional question, number three on the form says you can't, you have to have an operating budget for your shelter of less than 2 million hours. Uh, operating budget is 2 million, but our organizational budget is much more. Can we still apply? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Um, the We are asking for the annual operating budget of an organization, not a department or a subset of the organiz organization. The reason being the community needs grants are intended, are, are small uh, at $20,000 and are intended to support smaller grassroots organizations. And so it is a bit of an artificial number, uh, but uh, a limit nonetheless. Um, so if your organizational budget is larger than the 2 million, unless you can demonstrate that you are the only organization in a wider region providing these services, uh, you will not be, your application will not be considered. Uh, that said, all of the foundation's other grant streams do not have this limit. This um, budgetary constraint, it applies only to the community needs grants, again, because the amount is so small and the committee wants to prioritize where $20,000 can have a greater impact, i.e. in smaller organizations, uh, where $20,000 represents a much larger proportion of their work. Okay, so now I'm seeing no further questions. I thank you all for uh, making the time to listen. Hope that some of this was infor uh, information, the information was helpful. Uh, if you want to connect to talk about your proposal, if you want me to look at drafts, if you want to spitball some ideas, happy to do that. Please reach out by email sooner rather than later. I will send you a calendar invite to schedule a time of your choosing. Um, based on my own limited uh, Eastern uh, time zone hours and uh, happy to connect with you individually in that way. So thank you all for making the time and uh, best of luck. <laughs>